Mercedes together, hook them up in parallel and series, and charge them. And when they measure the mass, they're going to discover that that stack fully charged is 3% heavier by mass than it is when it's discharged. 3%. Do you understand why that's important? Because that electron that goes into that energy well does not have vectored velocity. It's moving, all right. It's got axial rotation. But it has no vectored velocity. It's not going anywhere. And it is energy. And it is mass. And it's at rest. E equals mass at some constant approaching zero. Period. Now, the standard model doesn't want to know that. And the standard model doesn't want to know what Humphrey Maris says about being able to split electrons means something about them. Fundamentally consistent with Gell-Mann's notion about violating the Pauli exclusion principle to have leptons constructed of two kinds of quarks, well, Humphrey Maris came along and said, okay, let's put them inside a frozen hydrogen bubble and let's zap them with a sonicator and we'll split them in half. And he did. Well, the standard model can't accommodate that because the way electrons are formed is not a part of the lexicon. They can't explain where electrons come from. All right? Well, hell, everything we're doing, producing energy, is about creating electron flow. If we don't know where they came from and how they're constructed and how they work, how in the world can we be effective about creating and managing them? Am I, am I missing something? Seems to me that's pretty fundamental. Other things in the standard model, it's all the same stuff that we've talked about, but the most important one of all is that the four quote-unquote primary field effects are primary. That is, the notion is that gravitational field effects, electromagnetics, the van der Waals force, and the strong nuclear force predated the Big Bang, that they are mutually exclusive and irreconcilable by nature, and that they and that they define the interactions for everything that happens thereafter. A priori field effects pre-existing the Big Bang. That's the assumption. Explicitly stated. It's just not true. It just isn't true. Look, if you have a primary field effect and you manipulate two of its derivatives what is the likelihood that the, that the manipulation of its two derivative products are going to change the effect of the primary force? You with me? If it's a primary force, take two of its products, manipulate them together. Do you change the primary force by doing that? So it's a new pop this evening. See? It's not possible. And the reason it's not possible is because gravitational field effects are a derivative product of a finer interaction. Every field effect is a product. There's only one that operates from the physical vacuum through the zero point, and Albert got that one right. And you talk about it. It's called the primary magnetic potential. And it operates at the finest scale. But it doesn't operate the way physics describes it. Because it's not about anything like electromagnetics. And that's how it's defined in the formulations. So, look. Uh, we talked a little bit about gravitational field effects here. You know about E.T. Whitaker? Does the name mean anything to you? E.T. Whitaker, 1903, Scottish mathematician and physicist, extremely bright guy, publishes a paper in Physics Letters A. And his paper says that gravitational field effects constitute an undulatory waveform. And this undulatory waveform has peaks and valleys, and it has instantaneous feedback between the masses regardless of the distance. Because there is a state in nature, in quaternion expressions, which were still being used then, there is a state in nature at which time and distance are not considerations. They're not considerations. 
So he goes through a set of partial differential equations, and he comes up with their product, 1904. He refines it, and he publishes this spectacular result. And it's fundamentally different than the result that Einstein and Podolsky and Rosen published. They came up with a whole different idea. A whole different deal. And Whitaker stuff used to be ubiquitously available on the Internet. It's been scrubbed now. You can't get it. Except on Bearden's and Seisman. Well, you can get it on mine, too, buddy. <laughs> we, make, we, make sure, we make sure it's out there. And if they scrub it, we'll put up another one. Because this is information that's categorical. It tells us things about gravitational field effects. Plotnikoff, who lives in Canada now, created his formulation of gravitational field effects. And he's got a, an expression in here, you'll see, called Z. And in that expression, what that expression connotes is the angle of the interaction between the masses. The angle of the interaction between the masses. It's dispositive. In a one-to-one, -one, mass-to-mass interaction, it's always linear. But when you have a galaxy, those interactions become very complicated real fast. And one of the problems with the Big Bang model is it can't explain how a galaxy that's 100,000 light years apart can operate in real time as a self-organizing system when the upper limit to information velocities is the speed of light. You know, that's simply not manageable. So what Plotnikov says is, look, we've got this Z function in here. We're seeing it in nature. And it means that between the masses, there's not only undulatory waveform characteristics, but there's also this angularity issue. The angles are dispositive. Anybody that's ever fooled around with magnetic motors knows that when you change the angles of the fields, things change. And you hit sweet spots and you hit dead spots. And boy, Minato's got a little motor now that's cooking because he got 54.73 degrees right on the nose. Got it going on. All right. Benoit Mandelbrot, guy that came sitting in his office in Avon, New York, looking out over the, over the treetops, one day comes up with this whole notion called fractals. I mean, it just came to him. There was no precursor in mathematics to fractals. No such animal. Okay, it just popped into his head. Well, look at his formula. Z, not equals, but comes to and goes from Z squared plus C. C means that it, that it happens instantaneously. And what it means is that you have boundedness and unboundedness that instantaneously in three dimensions and time feed back to each other until the noise threshold is breached and then it becomes unbounded and becomes an expression. The thing that's wonderful about a fractal is that it has self-similarity at every scale. And everything in nature is fractal. Absolutely everything. In point of fact, the fractal is the physical record of the evolution of a self-organizing, open, complex system. And it has a specific coupling with holograms. It is the local linear expression of a holographic dynamic. That's what fractals are. You won't find that in anybody's textbook, but wait till you see this. We'll go through the rest of this stuff. You know the Fibonacci numbers? Okay. 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5. Fibonacci numbers. It's the only number series in the world where the series 1.618 blah 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 as a subset 1 over is 0 0.618 blah blah blah. That's the only place in the world where it happens. And the golden mean then says some things about come on baby. When you map it in two dimensional frames what you get is a two-dimensional fractal. Every, express, every expression in the graph is self-similar at every scale to every other expression in the graph. It's a fractal. And when you map it, that's what you get. I want you to remember that shape. When you graph it in its logarithmic relationship, that's what you get.
Didn't work? Come on, baby. There you go. Now, it's like a 